restless, shifting, fugacious as time itself is a certain vast bulk of the population of the red brick district of New York's Lower West Side. Homeless, they have a hundred homes. They flit from furnished room to furnished room, transients forever. Transients in abode, transients in heart and mind. They sing home sweet home in ragtime. Hence, the houses of this district, having had a thousand dwellers, should have a thousand tales to tell. And it would be strange if there could not be found a ghost or two in the wake of all these vagrant guests. One evening after dark, a young man prowled among the crumbling old mansions looking for room to rent. At the twelfth, he put down his lean old baggage and rang the doorbell. Then came a housekeeper that made him think of an unwholesome surfeited worm. Come in, come in. I have a third floor back, vacant a week. Should you wish to have a look at it? They trod noiselessly up a stair carpet that its own loom would have forsworn. At each turn there were vacant niches in the wall. Perhaps plants had once been set up there. If so, they had died in that same foul, rancid air. This is the room. It's a nice room. It ain't often vacant. I had some elegant people in it last summer. No trouble at all and uh, paid in advance. The water's at the end of the hall. Oh, Sprouse and Mooney kept it three months. They done a vaudeville sketch. You know, Miss Brenta Sprouse. You may have heard of her. Well, those were just the stage names. The marriage certificate hung framed. Uh, the gas is here. And you see, there's plenty of closet space. It's a room everybody likes. It never stays idle long. Do you have many theatrical people rooming here? Oh, they comes and goes. A good proportion of my lodgers is connected with the theaters. Active people never stays long anywhere. Yes, they comes and goes. He engaged the room, paying for a week in advance. As the housekeeper moved away, he put for the thousandth time the question that he carried on the tip of his tongue. A young girl, Miss Vashner, uh, uh, Miss Eloise Vashner, uh, do you remember such a one of your lodgers? She would be singing on the stage, most likely, uh, a fair girl of medium height and slender, reddish gold hair and a dark mole near her left eyebrow. No, uh, I don't remember the name. <laughs> Them active people has names they change as often as their rooms. No, I don't call that one to mind. No, always no five months of ceaseless interrogation and inevitable negative. So much time spent by day in, in questioning managers, schools, choruses, by night among the audiences of the theaters from all-star cast down to music halls. So long that he dreaded to find her. He who had loved her best, he was sure that since her disappearance from home, this great city had held her somewhere. But it was like a monstrous quicksand, shifting its particles constantly with no foundation, its upper granules of today buried tomorrow in ooze and slime. The guest reclined, inert upon a chair, while there drifted into the room furnished sounds and furnished scents, doors banged somewhere, above him a banjo tingled with spirit, a cat yowled miserably upon a back fence, and he breathed the breath of the house, a dank savor rather than a smell, a cold, musty effluvium as from underground vaults mingled with the reeking exhalations of linoleum and mildewed and rotten woodwork. Then suddenly, as he rested there, the room was filled with the strong, sweet odor of mignonette. It came as upon a single buffet of wind with such sureness and fragrance that it seemed a living specter. The young man cried aloud, What, dear? As if he had been called and sprang up and looked about. The rich odor clung to him and wrapped around him. He reached his arms out for it. All his senses for the time confused and commingled. She has been in this room. The enveloping scent of mignonette the perfume she had loved and made her own. Whence came it? 
ransacking the drawers of the dresser, he came upon a discarded tiny ragged handkerchief. He pressed it to his face. It was racy and insolent with heliotrope. He hurled it to the floor. In another drawer, he found odd buttons, a theater program, a pawnbroker's card, two lost marshmallows, a book on the divination of dreams. And then he traversed the room like a hound on the scent, skimming the walls, considering the corners on his hands and knees, the drunken cabinet in the corner for a visible sign, unable to perceive that she was there beside, around, within, above him, clinging to him, wooing him, calling him so poignantly through the finer senses that even his grosser ones became cognizant of the call. Once again, he answered loudly, yes, dear, and turned wild eyes to gaze on vacancy. For he could not yet discern form and color and love and outstretched arm and the scent of mignonette. And then he thought of the housekeeper. He ran from the haunted room downstairs and to a door that showed a crack of light. She came out to his knock. He smothered his excitement best he could. Will you tell me, madam, who occupied the room I have before I came? Yes, sir, I, I can tell you again. Twas, twas Sprouls and Mooney, as I said. Miss Bretta Sprouls it was in the theaters, but Mrs. Mooney she was. My house is well known for respectability. The marriage certificate hung framed over the dresser. Well, what kind of a lady was Miss Sprouls? In looks, I mean. Why, uh, short and stout, sir, with a comical face, black hair. A and before they occupied it? Well, there was a single gentleman. He left Owen and me a week. Back of them was Miss Crowder and her two children. They stayed four months. And before that was old Mr. Doyle, whose sons paid for him. That goes back a year, sir. And further, I do not remember. The young man crept back to his room. The room was dead. The perfume of mignonette departed. In its place was the old, stale odor of moldy house furniture, atmosphere and storage. The ebbing of his hope had drained his faith. He sat staring at the yellow singing gaslight. Soon he walked to the bed and began to tear the sheets into strips. With the blade of his knife, he drove them tightly into every crevice of the window and door. When all was snug and taut, he turned out the light, turned the gas on full again, and laid himself gratefully upon the bed. Mrs. McCool, good to have a night out, isn't it? Rented out my third floor back this evening. Finally, young man, went up to bed two hours ago. And no, my dear, I did not tell him. You know what I say, rooms are furnished for to rent. I have a real sense for business, I do. There are some who would reject a room if they knew a suicide had been in the bed before them. She was a pretty thing she was, such a shame to be killing herself with the gas. A sweet little face she had with that reddish gold hair and that wee mole by her left eyebrow. Do fill up your glass again, Mrs. McCool. Ha, 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 ha.